Hi, I'm Gareth Porter for the Real News Network in Baltimore. Flint Leverett and Hillary Mann Leverett are the authors of a new book, Going to Tehran, which challenges all of the conventional wisdom about Iran and its nuclear program. They were both insiders in the U.S. national security state. They both worked as senior directors on Iran for the National Security Council staff, and then both worked for the State Department. But they quit the U.S. government in 2003 uh, in disagreement over U.S. policy toward the Middle East. Flint, Hillary, welcome to The Real News Network. Thanks very much. First, let me ask you both, as insiders or former insiders who went through a very rough transition to being outsiders, what was it like personally for both of you? You know, um, Hillary and I have both left our positions at the White House on the National Security Council staff in, in March 2003, just before the Iraq War. I came out of government entirely just a couple months later in May of 2003 and began almost immediately um, criticizing publicly various aspects of uh, U.S. policy toward the Middle East. And at the time, that was taken basically as a critique of the George W. Bush administration, which in important ways it was. And while that got me in, in trouble in some quarters, it, it made me acceptable, even in some ways useful, to let's say the center left part of the foreign policy establishment. First job I got when I came out was at the Brookings Institution. But then when, when Hillary came out too and we began um, focusing more in our, in our writing, our, our public statements on Iran and what was wrong with US policy toward Iran, that's when the establishment more generally began to get uncomfortable with us. And then when uh, Barack Obama was first elected and inaugurated and we began criticizing him very early on, and it became evident that our critique was not just a partisan critique of Republicans and neocons, but we were saying that Democratic administrations were as guilty as the Bush administration in, in their own ways of pursuing a kind of counterproductive and ultimately very destructive drive for dominance, for hegemony in, in the Middle East. And that's when our relations, what was left of them with the establishment, really, really began to, to, to fracture. I mean, we, of course, lost friends when we, we parted ways with the Bush administration and, and with the establishment. But what we really lost under the Bush administration was the establishment platform in the media. So for example, under the Bush administration, we published an, an op-ed in the New York Times every three or four months. We published over a dozen op-eds in the New York Times from 2003 to early 2010. Today, we can't get in the New York Times. Same thing with the PBS NewsHour. Flint would go on maybe four or five times a year. Today, maybe it's once a year. I used to be a regular on MSNBC during the Bush administration. Under the Obama administration, the same critiques are not really acceptable. And it's, you know, it's as if we learned less about Iran in the past three years, which has, has been problematic, and it's something wrong with us, and not something that is ever explored in terms of the, the establishment. So is the lesson of this experience that um, it's OK if you're seen as one of the two parties, but if you're outside the two parties, party consensus, that's a no-no, and you lose access to that, That's precisely, if you, if you criticize US, the drivers of U.S. foreign policy, that they're not partisan, they're not embedded in one party or the other, but there's something about the U.S. drive for dominance and hegemony in the Middle East and Asia in, in years past, or maybe coming into today, that is problematic across the board. And, and by, by taking that on, you know, we've tried to, to do that, and in, by doing so, you know, at this point, I don't think I probably could and wouldn't want to work in a mainstream think tank in Washington. I think those institutions have gotten far away from their original theoretical function anyway, so supposedly providing independent advice. Um, but, you know, I, I now make my living as an academic teaching international affairs at Penn State and happy doing that. What, what were the key turning points? What were the incidents, I should perhaps say, that caused each of you to decide that you were going to have to get out of the system? There was some that answers that for There were some pretty dramatic ones. I was the director for Persian Gulf Affairs at the White House, the, the person on the staff dealing with Iran, and worked very closely with the Iranians. At, right after 9-11, we had this exception to the rule where we could actually talk to Iranians over Afghanistan because it was in a multilateral context. It didn't have to do with U.S.-Iran 
affairs. And we work closely and constructively with them to overthrow the Taliban, send al-Qaeda on the run, in Germany to stand up the new political order, which became known as the Karzai government. But within weeks of that, here I am at the White House working hard on that, going to meet with the Iranians in Europe, with colleagues from the State Department. Within weeks of the success of overthrowing the Taliban, ousting al-Qaeda, standing up the new government, President Bush gives his State of the Union speech. I'm the staffer on the Persian Gulf. I'm not told that he is going to designate Iran as part of the axis of evil. This was a, this was a jarring moment. I decided to stay because I wanted to, to keep the talks with the Iranians on board, at least through the, the transition in Afghanistan, the lead up to the war in Iraq. But I didn't want to stay at the White House. That was, that was a bit too jarring. I left the White House, went to work for Colin Powell at the State Department. And while there, we get the Iranians send in through the Swiss an offer for a comprehensive dialogue for essentially a grand bargain. I take a look at that. I write the longest memo I think that Powell had received. He normally didn't want to receive a memo of more than two and a half pages. This was five pages. But it made the case for why we should test this offer, take the Iranians up on their offer for a grand bargain. Everything would be on the table. The nuclear program, Hamas, Hezbollah, everything. Went into this big black hole, but I saw Colin Powell a couple of weeks later at a going away party for someone. He comes up to me and he says, you know, that was a great memo, but I just couldn't sell at the White House. I later learned from a, another a, a colleague that uh, Cheney was the one who, who vetoed it. Not too much of a surprise there, but I can understand why that would be a turning point for sure. It was, and it was, it was really difficult with the invasion of Iraq, the war on terror, the treatment of Iran to, to stay and do much more inside. Now, your book, Going to Tehran, suggests that uh, the end of the Cold War was uh, much more of a, an important turning point in terms of U.S. policy toward the Middle East in general and Iran in particular mm -hmm. than is generally realized. Can you explain why you understand that, that it was so important? What, what is it that we've been missing about that turning point? Well, I think, I think we, we read American policy toward the Middle East and toward Iran is that the, the real primary driver for it that cuts across Democratic and Republican administrations is a desire for dominance, a desire for hegemony, not to have or come to terms with independent power centers in the, in the Middle East. This has been an American ambition going back all the way to World War II, but when World War II was over and the Cold War got started, the presence of another nuclear-armed superpower put some real constraints on how robustly the United States could pursue this agenda. This is one reason, for example, the United States never uh, put large deployments of ground or tactical air forces on the ground in the Middle East on an open-ended basis during, during the Cold War. But as the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union disappeared, that constraint also disappeared and it freed the U.S. to pursue dominance in the Middle East in a much more robust and direct way. And, and it coincides with or even feeds into the response uh, towards Saddam Hussein's invasion of mm -hmm. Kuwait, which for the first time we put half a million troops into the Middle East, something we would never have done during the Cold War, and something which inaugurates this era of trying to get states, especially Arab states, to sign up to, to agree to the governments in these states, a highly militarized U.S.-led political and security order for the Middle East, which we then put it in terms of these feel-good words of a peace process. We inaugurate a peace process for the Middle East. The peace process for the Middle East is just rhetoric. What it was about was to lock in Arab states in their weakened position, some of them like Saudi Arabia, in fact, occupied with US thousands, tens of thousands of US troops, to bring them into this highly militarized US-led political and security order to, to cardin off the one remaining challenger to US dominance, which was mm -hmm. after the, the Iraq war, the Islamic Republic of Iran, which just as a final note, is the reason why we reactivate the Fifth Fleet to, to patrol the Middle East, not with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, not in 1990, not in 1991, in 1995, after we've defeated Iraq and the only challenger is Iran, that's when we need the Fifth Fleet and we re reactivate it and base it in Bahrain. So tell me, how close did the United States actually come in the post, immediate post-Cold War period? to coming to terms with Iran, to actually engaging seriously with Iran? We, we had a real chance. Um, Bush 41, um, at the beginning of his administration, um, sent messages to Iran that if they would help get the last American hostages out of Lebanon, he would reciprocate towards them. They delivered, um, but coming out of the Gulf War and the end of the Cold War, Bush 41 
reneged. The, the key thing here is that the, uh, unlike the conventional wisdom in the United States, particularly inside the Beltway, the Islamic Republic of Iran is fiercely independent in its foreign policy, but it is not implacably anti-American. Mm -hmm. And so it has periodically worked with the United States, as Flynn said, in Lebanon, but also in Bosnia and Afghanistan. It has negotiated with the United States and other parties on the nuclear issue. They are willing to come to the table. They are willing to work with us. But the key is they will not subordinate their foreign policy to U.S. dictates, to a U.S.-led political and security order. They are determined to make the security order in the Middle East more balanced, where they can pursue an independent foreign policy. Thank you, Flynn and Hillary. Thank you. Uh, join us, please, for part two of this uh, interview with Hillary Mann Leverett and Flint Leverett on the Real News Network.